nau mama nau hamu rongo na murongo nia mi tu sosolo mamu mai musai dan nene am tolu sosolo bola taiga ca hando menabanga tala hamu mendo kamu mai mai kita tutuwatu hinia ma maure taunda nene nau mama nau hamu ma kusua ingo do ni lamu our keynote speakers, conference presenters, participants, observers, conference organizers, faculty, and those of you in Hawaii, as well as those of you who have joined us from other countries. My name is Tassisius Kabu Taulaka. I am currently the director of the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. On behalf of the Center, I welcome all of you to the ninth annual Center for Pacific Island Studies Students Conference. This annual gathering, led and organized by our CPA students, has come a long way from a very humble beginning. It provides students with the venue and opportunity to meet, share their work and experiences, and exchange ideas and knowledge. Where I come from, there is a saying that Andodonna eva hambuluna lao, hita tamanina chikai sumba hambuluna, which translates to something like, knowledge is like a cobweb. We each possess only one or a few strands. What this means that it only becomes a cobweb when we connect the strands that we possess with those that others have. Only then can we build a core wave of knowledge and wisdom. This conference, like those before it, provides students the opportunity to build core waves of knowledge across disciplines, departments, universities, communities and countries. But this year is particularly important because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impacts that it has had and continues to have on us individually and collectively. Hence, the theme for this year's conference, navigating our unfamiliar seas, cultivating new connections and changing spaces. I think you will agree with me that in many ways 2020 was unlike any other. Globally, over 2.6 million people have so far died from COVID-19, including over 500,000 here in the US. Many universities, including the University of Hawaii, closed their four wall classrooms and moved to online spaces. Governments, close national borders or restricted the movement of people. Many businesses and individuals lost sources of income and livelihoods. The pandemic caught the world with its proverbial pants down, exposing the flaws and vulnerabilities of modern civilization and especially the ideologies and structures that have long influenced human imaginations, aspirations, and the ways in which the world is organized. But at the same time, it challenges us to rethink our place and roles in the world and find new pathways and trajectories of change. It provides new spaces, connections, and opportunities for us to rethink issues and how we organize human societies. That is why we are gathered here, to give you, our next generation of leaders, the opportunity to explore new spaces, connections, and opportunities. In the next two days, we want you to do that openly and respectfully. We want you to share and connect that strand of knowledge that you have with those that others have, so we can build a cobweb of knowledge and wisdom that makes use of these new opportunities 
spaces and connections, but at the same time captures the dust of past experiences and deep knowledge. Talking about new spaces, this is the first time that the Center for Pacific Island Studies has ever organized a conference online. So please bear with us as we navigate the technology and unfamiliar sea. This year, the number of presenters is much smaller than in previous years. However, over 250 people have registered, which is our largest registration ever. So we hope we can all share knowledge. At this point, I want to take the opportunity to thank you our, for participating, whether as a presenter or as an observer. Thank you for your generosity in sharing your knowledge. Without you, there would be no conference. Let me also thank our three keynote speakers, Dr. Emelani Case, Dr. Akiemi Glenn, and Dr. Wilfred Alec. Thank you for the honor that you bring to our students' conference by gracing us with your time and words. I also want to acknowledge the Dean for our College of Arts, Languages and Letters, Professor Peter Anade, who wanted to join us this morning, but was unable to do so because of other commitments. Thank you for his support. Finally, thank you to the conference organizers, our CIPIS graduate assistants and lecturers, Joshua Uipi, Zakia Boyga, Heather Garidor, Shannon Pomaikai Hennessy, and Axel Defjin. I also want to acknowledge Vicky Lucan and Rembo Siruao, our student volunteers from the UH Library's Pacific Collection. I must also acknowledge my colleague, Dr. James Viennes, the CIPUS Outreach Director, who is the faculty advisor to the organizing committee, not only this year, but also in previous years. Thank you, James, for all that you have done. Thank you also to the CIPIS faculty and affiliate faculty for your continuous support to our students and to the conference. I wish you a successful conference and look forward to learning from you. Do Solihana, no Mama Nao Hamo, and Tagio Tomas. Thank you, Dr. Kaputalaka. My name is Shannon Pumakai Hennessy. I am a graduate assistant here at the Center for Pacific Island Studies. CIPIS is based in Honolulu, Hawaii, on the island of Oahu. We begin the formal program by acknowledging with deep gratitude and respect Hawaii's Kanaka Maoli, the native people of this land. We are honored to open this event with an oli offered by Helena Kapuni Reynolds. Aloha mai kako. I'm just going to quickly post the translation here because this is an oli that is noa. It is one that everyone can learn. So if you are at Manoa, I encourage you to learn it as well as something that you can use um, and put within your own arsenal of practices to greet and to welcome those um, to the places that we call home and to the places that we work in. So this is an oli by uh, Dr. Kiave Lopes in Hawaiian studies at Manoa, Veli na Manoa. Veli na Manoa i kalehu aloha, aloha ua tua hine. Mai lua hine a iwa i kiki, kia i ke kahau kani, kani no na leo. Eo kama aina, aina aloha e. Manoa e. Welcome virtually to Manoa, home of the beautiful Tuahine rains and the Kahaukani winds, located 
between Luahine all the way to Waikiki is the Ahupua'a, where Manoa is situated. And we welcome you all to this conference, to CIPES, housed at UH Manoa. And we hope that you have a wonderful experience over the next few days. Aloha. Mahalo, Helena, for giving us such intention in this space, virtual space even. Okay, so now it's my honor to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Dr. Emily Case. Dr. Case is a lecturer in Pacific Studies at Teherenga Waka Victoria University of Wellington. As a Kanaka Maoli woman, activist, and writer, she is deeply engaged in issues of Indigenous rights and representation, settler colonialism and decolonization, and environmental and social justice. Her work is motivated by a desire to strengthen trans-Indigenous solidarities across the Pacific to work toward building better futures. She's from Waimea, Hawaii. Dr. Case's intellectual mo'oku auhau, or genealogy, weaves with ours here at CIPIS. While she did not graduate from one of our programs, she did enroll in our courses and continues to contribute to the center throughout her career in the University of Hawaii system and beyond. Even in Aotearoa, her work is intimately tied to that of a CIPIS alum, the late Teresia Tiaiwa, as Dr. Case is serving in the Pacific Studies program Tiaiwa founded. The conference committee was eager to invite Dr. Case to bring her knowledge, insights, and heart in a Pacific Studies context as we navigate our unfamiliar seas. As a Kanaka Maoli woman myself, I personally admire Dr. Case as the kind of scholar activist with a trans-Pacific focus that I aspire to be. Please welcome Dr. Emily Case. Aloha mai kako. Oh, I was actually getting a, a tad bit emotional thinking about um, my time in Manoa um, as a master's student there, studying in the, uh, the uh, English department, but of course, taking courses with, with CIPIS. Um, and then, yeah, just hearing Helena, um, thinking of home. It's so beautiful to be able to share this space with all of you. And I'm totally uh, humbled by the invitation to come and share some words today. So I'm going to share my screen um, because I do have some slides. And we'll, we'll get into it. So the, the title of my keynote this morning is Navigating Roots. Um, I sort of took the theme of the conference, navigating our unfamiliar seas, cultivating new connections and changing spaces, and kind of wanted to give a, a bit of a grounded perspective on that because we are all physically grounded where we are and travel is quite limited. Um, throughout my, my keynote, you're going to hear me um, repeat this olelo no eo, this proverb, and I will define it for you um, in a little while, but you're going to hear me say e koloana no kieve i kieve. Um, and I'd like to invite you, wherever you are, um, to say it with me when I get to the parts of the keynote where I repeat this olelo no eo, either say it with me and if you can't say the whole thing, just say ikeve at the end. Um, and it's my way of kind of bringing you into the keynote. Um, you might be sitting by yourself, you might be sitting with others, that's okay. Um, hopefully we can activate some collectivity with this one repeating phrase um, that you'll hear again throughout uh, this morning's address. So. Uh, without any further delay, I'll just get into it. Um, and once again, just say thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to meet with all of you, wherever you are zooming in from. Um, it's an honor and it's a privilege. Mahalo nui. E koloana no kieve, i kieve. When my niece was born, we took her ieve, her placenta, to the forest and planted it under a kukui tree, a tree of light. As we walked the edge of the forest, my brother carried the kukui tree that my mom had started growing in a small pot at our house, and my sister-in-law held my little niece in her arms wrapped in blankets. Though she was still so small at the time, her presence was large. The day she was born, hawks flew outside her window, 
giving her the name she now carries, Ka'il, and with it, flight. The tree was to mark where her Iebe would be buried, where it would sprout, stretch, crawl, and grow into the ground, even as she soared high above it. The practice of burying Iebe is not a new one, but one that stretches back generations. Despite our ancestral memories of this custom, though, it was only recently that I truly understood the brilliance of it. For Kanaka Maoli, when your placenta is buried in the earth, you are grounded to that earth. No matter where you go, it is your place, the one you can always return to, whether by walking the physical landscape or traversing dreamscapes. The burial reminds me of something Epeli Hauofa once said about his piece of earth. In the turbulence of his life, it was his anchor, one that could not be taken away. The burial also reminds me of how our lives can begin and end in soil, in dirt, with roots. When I think about the different places I've seen Iebe planted and the different trees placed above them, I recall spaces cleaned and cleared made ready for the planting. I recall spaces near people's homes, in backyards, in special areas where the life of the tree could be monitored closely, especially after it intertwined with the life of the child becoming their signal of health. In Hawaii, the word placenta, the word for placenta, ieve, comes from eve, meaning sprout or rootlet, lineage or kin. We have a saying, a proverb, e koloana no kieve, the root will creep toward the root. In other words, family will seek family, kin will find kin. And when they do, the hope is that they will love each other and nourish each other underground. When my brother planted my niece's placenta and her kukui tree in the forest, it was not that he was trying to separate her from our family's land or bind her to the ground to keep her from flying, but that he was allowing her ewe, her many roots to grow, stretch, and reach those around her. Trees, I have learned, are remarkable in that they can support each other at the roots, feeding each other, nourishing each other, keeping each other alive in the dirt. Planting her ieve in the forest therefore ensured that she would be able to grow into a complex network of roots, creeping and crawling in the dark, damp soil, finding her way back to thousands of ancestors standing tall above her, each ancient and each given new life through her, because of her, with her at their sides. I begin with this story of rootedness at a conference calling us to reflect on how we might navigate unfamiliar seas and cultivate new connections in changing spaces, because I wonder, if in these times of mass uncertainty, it might be helpful to focus on roots, on Eve. In other words, when we cannot physically travel to reach and hold one another, when social and physical distancing means we cannot be seated in the same room and must communicate through screens, and when our movements have largely been restricted to where we were when the world changed last year, I wonder, if in our preoccupation with routes and oceanic migrations and pathways to each other across our sea of islands, we might sometimes forget that it is also through our roots that we are and can be routed back to each other under the ground in the dirt and darkness where kin will find kin and where new life can sprout from those connections. I begin with this story because I wonder if when we look out at the ocean that connects us, attempting to navigate these unfamiliar seas, we might become accustomed. We might become so accustomed to looking beyond that we sometimes forget to look down, to dig our fingertips into soil, to tap into and feed the energy of the roots where we are, wherever that happens to be in space and time, knowing that when we are better in place, we are better for place and everything that connects. I begin with this story because I wonder if in our remembrances of oceanic connectedness and our past movements around the Pacific, often, often into and through each other's spaces, we forget, as Tracy Banivanua Mar once said, that even while mobility is indigenous to Oceania, not all of us were or are navigators, not all of us were or are saltwater people. I begin with this story because I wonder if so much emphasis on Moana, 
the name that some have advocated we adopt for the region, we forget those in the Pacific whose tongues have not and do not know the taste of that word or the feel of its salt on their lips because they have their own expressions, their own tastes. And because as Julia Gray once said, Moana, the word simply means not a lot to them. I wonder if in our attempts to speak of regional solidarities, in other words, we forget the ruptures that exist and the ways we sometimes perpetuate disconnection. Finally, I begin with this story at a conference about navigating unfamiliar seas because I wonder if there might be some value in navigating roots of using the time we're in and our physical groundedness to think about how we might navigate where we are, to consider how the new connections we cultivate might actually be connections waiting to be renewed, how we might deepen our relationships with place so that we can remember that as much as we are connected by seas, we are also connected by land. Perhaps it, it is in the land that we can forge stronger relationships, stronger solidarities, and stronger visions for a future we are growing towards, reaching towards now, underground, in the dark, where it is sometimes hot and sometimes tiresome and sometimes even fraught with danger, but where there is always the opportunity to meet with Eve. E koloana no kieve, i kieve. Just before the borders closed last year, I was supposed to fly home to Hawaii to deliver a keynote at this conference. <laughs> I had written a speech. I had prepared to talk about a new or renewed oceanic consciousness. Then everything changed. Gatherings were quickly canceled, flights were grounded, and I have not been able to return to Hawaii since. In the year that's passed, I found myself trying to navigate the stillness, the grounding, the being in place, while still trying to reach across the ocean to nurture relationships with home, not knowing the next time I'll be able to be there. Today, I join you virtually from Te Whanganui Atara, Aotearoa, New Zealand, positioned on the part of the North Island known as the head of Maui's fish, Te Upoko o Te Ika a Maui, a fish, a sea creature that is also land. Today, I think about how every day here is an effort and an invitation to navigate the ocean and the ground simultaneously, attempting to both stand and swim at the same time, trying to find my way in and on lands of water, thousands of miles away from my piece of earth where my eve are planted. The past year has made me ground, made me dig into dirt and find myself in it, even though I was once hesitant to do so. When I first returned to Aotearoa close to three years ago, I was determined to keep myself from feeling too comfortable here. I called myself a settler. I walked lightly and carefully. I kept myself from extending any roots, afraid that planting myself in the soils here would disrupt those already planted, unsettling them or uprooting them to make space for me. I even resisted the urge to call it home and corrected myself when I misspoke and accidentally implied that I was from here. My piece of earth I maintained was across the ocean in Hawaii in a place known for stinging kipu'upu'u rains. This of course did not account for the diversity of our stories and for lived realities in the Pacific that are unlike my own, for the fact that there are so many Pacific peoples who do not feel attached to a piece of earth or whose strongest connections are not to the lands their ancestors came from but to the lands their grandparents, parents, or they themselves have moved to. Still, living in Wellington City, a city that sometimes feels disorienting, I somehow convinced myself that maybe spending most of my days walking on concrete rather than solid earth was somehow appropriate. Cityscapes keep us from the ground, I told myself, separated in body and sometimes in consciousness, and in doing so, keep us from planting our roots in lands that are not ours. They keep us from being complicit in the colonial process of making home in someone else's home. I was terribly wrong, of course. However, that's what I tried to convince myself of, all in the effort to not be the settler that settles too deeply. In all of my attempts, however, I yearned for connection, for the chance to feel my feet touch soil, to walk amongst trees and streams rather than buildings, and to truly greet and grow to love Aotearoa from beneath it, from inside it, from the dirt, 
I started to seek spaces of quiet, spaces where I could sit and talk to trees, listen to flowing waters, greet mountains, and hear all of the stories they had to tell me. And in every small pocket of space I found, I felt myself release a little. My breaths slowly evened, deepening in my chest. I started to settle into a new relationship, to nestle into spaces, to feel love growing in my gut, all the while knowing that this was a privilege, one not even afforded to all of the people who are deeply rooted here, but who may not yet know they belong to generations of Eve underground. In those moments, and in respecting the privilege enough to make the most of it, I realized that in denying myself the chance to root and grow, I had also denied myself the chance to act upon the connections I already knew existed. I knew of oceanic connectedness. I studied it. I taught it. I teach it. I knew that our Pacific peoples, although distant in space, are always present in each other's ancestral and recent memories, some of them beautiful and others painful. But in convincing myself that rooting in place was inherently colonial, I did not allow myself to act, to truly act on those connections, too scared that my impact would reinforce colonial power rather than dismantle it. In finding spaces of connection, however, I realized that no one benefited from my disconnection, not even me. In trying to be respectful of the indigenous places and peoples I do not belong to in Aotearoa, I also denied my ancestral ability and my ancestral responsibility to seek and find kin underground and to nourish. I therefore turned my gaze from the ocean that connects and while still always mindful of it, I looked down to the ground that moved, flowed and swelled beneath me. When I started to learn more about trees, about the way trees of the same family will nurse those that have been chopped down, keeping old stumps alive by feeding them through their interconnected roots, or the way they will make space for each other at the canopy so that they all have a share of the light, light that will feed them from trunk, from leaf to trunk to ground. I began to see my place differently. I even began to see the city differently. The city I live in, I realized, is a colonial construction, like a machine that operates in service to ongoing settler colonialism in place, reinforcing colonial narratives in every street name, in every statue, in every flagpole, in the hypervisibility of colonial possession. The city then can function to keep us from extending roots, not to claim space, but to find each other in the dark and to strengthen each other underground. When I think about my niece and her Ieve planted in the forest behind my family home, I am confident that while we may not all have been navigators or saltwater people, and while our movements may be restricted in the current time, we all have the capacity to love and appreciate place and to honor those whose roots are most deeply buried in the soils where we live, work, and create. My kupuna called this love aloha aina. It is a fierce and ferocious love, one that stems from seeing land, as in, land and environment as family. It is a protective love and quite often it is a painful one. While the words aloha aina come from Hawaii, I know that other peoples and cultures around the Pacific have their own ways of loving place, of expressing and acting upon connections to place and of safeguarding it for the future. While I will not pretend to know the words others use to articulate this love or to understand the intricacies and specificities of its expression, I know it's there, stretching across our sea of islands, giving us something to connect with and something to act upon collectively. I see this kind of love here in Aotearoa when the land is referred to as Papatuanuku, as a mother, and when mountains and rivers each have names, genealogies, and stories, I see this kind of love when people acknowledge them, pray to them, honor and protect them, tell their stories in carvings and in motions. I saw this kind of love at Ihumatau, in the woman who stood barefoot on grass holding her pregnant belly and the unwavering commitment to protecting that child's future in that place. I saw it in the woman who planted garden boxes to feed kaitiaki guardians and in the elders who sat around fires to keep the land warm and in the children who now only know of a life at, who now only know of life as something to be lived in relation to the earth. 
I see it expressed in my friend Nadine Ann Huda's poem, Rest Now, E Papatuanuku, that speaks of how grounded flights and COVID lockdowns gave the earth the chance to breathe last year. Breathe easy and settle right here where you are, she writes. We'll not move upon you for a while. We'll stop, we'll cease, we'll slow down and stay home, draw each other close and be kind, kinder than we've ever been. I wish we could say we were doing it for you as much as ourselves, but heaha, she reflects, we're doing it anyway. I hear this kind of love in Katerina Tewa's stories of Banaba when she refers to local family units as kainga, which means the place that feeds. And I hear it when her sister, the late Teresia Tewa, teaches us that in Banaban knowledge systems, land is equivalent to blood. In their words, I hear the inseparability, inseparability of land and people. I hear of land that runs through veins, that feeds, that keeps us alive. I hear this kind of love in Teresia's poetry when she calls the sky, the earth, and the ocean mothers, each creative in their destruction, making lightning storms, volcanoes, tidal waves. They are mothers who endure and who outlive what they create. I hear this kind of love when they talk about an island they can't live on and land that is now dispersed, their mind phosphate having been dropped by planes onto others' landscapes to feed others' soils and others' profits. I feel this kind of love when the chief of the Komodo people in West Papua motions to a motionless river and says, nature is a blessing, but life is very difficult now. I feel this kind of love, a love that comes with ache when he has to react to the slow motion genocide in his country, one that continues to attack his people both in physical violence and in environmental degradation. We depend on the environment, he says, even while the Grassberg mine bores a hole into a mountain and sediment, sediments raise riverbeds, suffocating waterways and starving West Papuans. I feel this kind of love when I see people who are willing to stand against the injustice, even risking their lives to raise the Morning Star flag for land, for people, and for freedom. And I know this kind of love when even during a global pandemic, Kia'i or guardians stand on Aina ready to protect it. I knew it when I saw them wearing masks, standing socially distanced, responding to the call of a greedy mayor who decided one year ago that it was the right time to commence construction at Hunana Niho, desecrating, uprooting Ewe, disrupting soils during a time of global death. I knew it when I saw three dozen kupuna arrested on Mauna Kea a year prior, when I saw people chained to a cattle guard for hours, when I saw women link arms on a roadway to block destruction. I knew it when I saw my cousin Pua Case stand on the same roadway with ehu hair like a fire growing and raging within her chanting ehu e. We will and we are rising like mighty waves, waves on land, waves of collectivity and strength, waves that even reverberate and move underground. No matter what we call it, we all have the capacity to love place fiercely. And I believe it is, it is in our indigenous knowledges and in our ancestral wisdoms that we will find the best way to do so for each other, wherever we happen to be in Oceania. If the past year has taught me anything, it is that we all have the ability to pause, to remember the earth, to slow down and to listen to it and to grow that fierce, intimate, and sometimes heartbreaking love that will motivate, push, and maintain our protective actions for it. Our worlds need that love. And as I often try to relay to my students, when we allow our Eve to crawl, stretch, and grow into the lands we stand on, learning the names, histories, genealogies, and heartbreaks of the places we're in, even if we aren't from them, we experience that deep love and then have the capacity to extend it out to the rest of the region. All of my focus on land though is not meant to take away from the ocean and from our oceanic connectedness. Instead, it is to remind us of the grounds upon which we do our work for the region especially as we are grounded and restricted in our movements, forced to navigate the unfamiliarity of immobility. 
When I think of staying in place, I'm reminded of the brilliance of our ancestors who remembered travel, mobility, migration, and navigation in concepts remembered and honored across generations through both routes and routes. Years ago, when I set out on a journey to complete a PhD, I studied one of these concepts, kahiki, the ancestral homeland we as Hawaiians say we come from. Though not a specific place on a map, kahiki is the knowing that before arriving in Hawaii, our ancestors, those who were navigators and who were saltwater peoples, came from other places in Oceania. Other Pacific peoples have their own names and descriptions for these homelands. In Aotearoa, it is Hawaii, and for Albert Wendt, it is simply the place where our hearts will find meaning. I sought meaning in Kahiki, but in doing so, I initially limited myself to only seeking the meaning I actually wanted to find. I romanticized Kahiki. It was my genealogical link to the rest of the Pacific, my link still remembered in song and story, in chant and proverb, in, pro in prophecy and poetry. It was my justification for being in the Pacific. In studying it though, in studying it therefore, I wanted to see everything beautiful about an oceanic connectedness, solidarities and strength, a unified sea of islands, a growing commitment to Hau'ofa's regionalism, all of us reaching back to our ancestral memories of each other to stand as Pacific peoples together. Kahiki, however, didn't and still doesn't allow for such nostalgia. In my research, where I wanted to find Hawaiian anti-imperialist sentiments expressed through Kahiki, I found it sometimes being used in the 19th century to support annexation by the United States, turning us away from the Pacific, where I wanted to find unity I often found tension and where I wanted to use kahiki to make myself feel comfortable and connected to the Pacific at large, I found it forcing me to be honest about the connections and disconnections in our region, the tensions, the ruptures, and the times when those we seek to connect to do not want to be connected with, when not every root, in other words, actually wants to be sought out and found in the dirt. In my exploration of the Pacific, I had to be real about what Pacific I was referring to in my work. In 2019, when I revisited my PhD research to turn it into a book, I found my previous work to be too narrow. It did not confront the fact that the oceanic region I was referring to was largely Polynesian, that it was based primarily in, two, in the two places I've lived and worked in, Hawaii and Aotearoa, and was therefore framed by experiences based in settler colonial societies. Consequently, it did very little to acknowledge the independent Pacific, the islands and cultures in Micronesia and Melanesia, which are far too diverse to be adequately addressed with those umbrella terms, and the Francophone, Sinophone, and Hispanophone Pacifics. It did very little, if anything at all, to acknowledge that not everyone in the region sees themselves or experiences themselves as indigenous, a word I've been using quite loosely. It did not account for the fact that some islanders do not associate with the word, especially when they, unlike us, are the majority in their own homelands and do not need to be categorized as indigenous against the dominance of any other grouping. After her research in Tuvalu, my friend Jess Jessica Marinacho quoted one of her interviews as saying quite simply, we're not indigenous, we're just, we're us. But my early research wanted all Pacific peoples to be aboard the same metaphorical canoe, traveling in the same direction, fighting for land and place and justice in the region, and even now all navigating the same unfamiliar seas. While this is not necessarily a goal to abandon, I realized that there could be no traveling as long as I denied the experiences, the specificities, the cultural nuances, and the diversity of a region I wanted to represent in fullness, even while I simultaneously flattened it. There could be no canoe either, not as long as I was intent on guiding it alone, even while unfamiliar with all of the waters we would sail through. There could be no connectedness, not as long as I was unwilling to acknowledge the ruptures and to confront the ways I was unconsciously propagating them in my work. In 2019, as I buried myself in my small Aotearoa apartment to revise a book manuscript based on my PhD research, I started to unravel the limitations of my prior work, exploring what it meant when I represented the Pacific in particular ways, what it implied when I focused so intently on some things, some peoples and some places over others, and what could happen if I was not honest about my positionality, 
my goals and my shortcomings. I started to read through the pages and realized that even in my wanting to make certain things visible, I rendered so much more invisible. I looked at the text and thought, if West Papua only appears in my narratives as genocide, if Tuvalu only appears in my narratives as sinking islands, if Nauru only appears in my narratives as phosphate mining, if Fiji only appears in my narratives as coups and conflicts, if Rapa Nui only appears in my narratives as Moai, if the Marshall Islands only appear in my narratives as nuclear testing sites, if Tahiti only appears in my narratives as a French colony, if Guahan only appears in my narratives as heavily militarized and perhaps worst of all, if these places only appear in my narratives as token representations that I fall back on to acknowledge diversity as this speech has just done, then I am not feeding their roots. I am only reinforcing the single narratives that are depleting their soils. I mentioned these tensions, these difficulties and these harsh realities at a conference about navigating unfamiliar seas because I sometimes think that the unfamiliar territory I am traversing is the uncomfortable, the messy, the sticky, and what my students and I sometimes refer to as the stink. It is the swampy ground, part land and part water, where things can sometimes be stagnated, where we can be stagnated, and where we can struggle to find our way. Swamps, though, are incredibly fertile and are often home to the roots, the sprouts, and the life that cannot be found elsewhere. Therefore, it may be in the messy that we have the best opportunity to grow and reconnect. Last year, while trying to teach Pacific studies during a global pandemic as marches for Black lives were ongoing in the States, while shouts and cries for freedom and justice were being heard and felt worldwide, and while we were all trying to cope with the unfamiliar, my students and I talked about the wetlands, the swampy, sometimes murky, in between spaces beneath our feet. While so many of them are accustomed to thinking of the Pacific as being out there, beyond the shores of Aotearoa, I tried to use our groundedness to bring them back to place, back to roots and waters under and over ground. The truth about our region, as Wendt said so beautifully before, is that it is so vast, so varied, and so dazzling that only the imagination in free flight can hope, if not to contain her, to shape, to grasp some of her shape, plumage, and pain. The more I learn about the region and the more I learn about myself in it, the more I realize just how much I don't know, how many unseen how many unseen gaps and silences there are to uncover and reveal, and just how much work we have yet to do, especially if Pacific kin want to find kin and meet in meaningful ways. When I moved back to Aotearoa almost three years ago, I thought about how to harness some of Oceania's diversity and how to bring some of the vast expanse of our sea of islands to my students. I read Teresia's published reflections with over 1200 indigenous languages, one fifth of the contemporary world's linguistic and cultural diversity, she said. The region commonly known as the Pacific Islands is so huge and so varied and the pedagogical tasks consequently so complex that the notion of a single all knowing teacher delivering knowledge from the front of the classroom is ludicrous. Considering then the almost ridiculous nature of our title as Pacific Studies teacher, I took teachers, I took on the daunting task of teaching a course Teresia created and taught for over 15 years, an introduction to the Pacific and to Pacific Studies, one in which Teresia grabbed at students' hearts and pulled them into the region. Though I'd much rather she still be here with us, teaching her, teaching it herself with all of her fiery brilliance. I took on the challenge knowing that I had her to guide me, that she had written so much about our work in Pacific Studies that she had charted a course for me and for all of us. Taking her advice, however, I knew that I could not merely follow her. I had to also find my own way and chart the new directions I would decided to travel myself. With so much diversity and with the impossibility of ever addressing it all, Teresia showed me that perhaps the most meaningful journey I can take my students on is one that starts where we are, where we stand, and where despite layers of concrete and culverts, roots still run deep underground. It is from where we are, she showed me, 
that we could then move more intentionally outward. Attempting to do so, however, meant that I had to learn about the place I was in, that I had to get closer to the ground, even if and when the city tried to prevent it, and that I had to bring my, my knowing and feeling of Aloha Aina to the peace of the Pacific I was now inhabiting. I asked myself the question, a question I now pose to my students, what had to happen in order for us to be here? More than thinking about their parents or grandparents migrating to Aotearoa from other Pacific Islands, I asked my students to think about the ground beneath them. What was it before it was called Wellington, I asked. In one of our early classes last year, we talked about streams, streams we can't see or hear, but streams that still run under the city. I introduced them to the stream that runs under the university they study at, Kumutoto. And though they couldn't touch it, and though teaching at the time meant we had to meet virtually, disconnected from each other and from the land, I encouraged them to acknowledge it, to know that it flows in the dark, curving through culverts and tunnels, spaces we cannot see, all while we sit on top of it in university classrooms learning about the Pacific. I tried to emphasize the point that we cannot look out and reach out to protect the region if we do not first acknowledge the pain we stand on or the destruction that made our learning in that space possible. I never do this with the intention of making my students feel bad about being there. Instead, I do it so that we can begin at the very beginning of our journey in Pacific studies by asking tough and honest questions about how we relate and how we can nurture relationships starting with the lands, even the wet and the swampy and unfamiliar ones we live on. We get beyond seeing the places we're in through, len through the lens of tokenism and we get into the dirty, the wet and the stink, hoping to then cultivate an appreciation for that same depth that exists everywhere. <laughs> In the past year, my students and I have had to face different problems and issues magnified by COVID-19. Therefore, my teaching has had to shift. And this year, I am more intentional about folding into our conversations about the Pacific, the larger themes of colonialism, racism, and white supremacy. Students are coming into classrooms hungry for conversation, for understanding, for anything that will help them cope and deal with their changing worlds. Whereas students in the past, particularly my Pacific students, may have been hesitant to talk about racism and white supremacy, they are now ready to see their own histories and lived realities in relation to it. In the first week of Pussy 101, my students and I look at racial hierarchies imposed on the Pacific when explorers like Johann Forrester came sailing into our Sea of Islands, writing his observations on human variation. Based on his own assumed superiority, he ranked islanders based on their, or based on our proximity to whiteness. In week one of the class, we talk about how his racist gradations still impact how we see each other and how we see ourselves. Though the content of the course is heavy, I see some students lean back, pause, and have tiny moments of clarity, which helps them to give language and history to what they've always known but may never have been able to explain. Now I see that racism is not just black and white, but can exist in our own communities, one student remarked last week. When people said we weren't smart enough to sail, they were just trying to say we were inferior, another realized. Even when discussing these larger social and cultural issues, however, we also bring the conversations back to place. We unpack the violence with which the country we live in, Aotearoa, was colonized. And in doing so, students start to recognize structures of power everywhere, starting with the disappeared streams beneath their feet, crawling and stretching all the way back in time to the era of discovery that challenged land as being central in identity and replaced it with proximity to whiteness and growing forward back out to the rest of the region where internalized notions of both superiority and inferiority between us has affected our ability and sometimes even our willingness to relate. In these classes, Aotearoa is reframed. No longer is it just the New Zealand nation that Pacific peoples from out there in the, in the region migrated to. It is the home of Pacific kin, of Tangata Whenua, people of this land who we are related to by whakapapa, by genealogy, and therefore have obligations to. I am not always successful, but I do believe that starting in place, planting our roots into the grounds we learn and live on, helps us to reach back out to the rest of the region.
when we tap into the wet, swampy, and sometimes smelly messiness of where we reside, thinking more intentionally about where we are, we can then think about how to extend that same sense of awareness, responsibility, and intimacy out to the rest of the Pacific. Ekolowana no kieve, ikieve. Kahiki, the concept I started exploring so many years ago, has helped me both in and out of the classroom. Last year, in one of the most tumultuous years of our lives, I had to use Kahiki to encourage my own reconnection with the region, reconnection that did not ignore my own inadequacies and shortcomings, but that used them to cultivate stronger relationships. When my ancestors settled in Hawaii and when travel between their home and other islands in the Pacific ceased, they maintained memory of other places and peoples in their use of Kahiki. Kahiki was the memory of connection. Today, it is what motivates me to act upon that connection, to know that even if and when my physical movement is limited, and while we may not know when we will be able to cross into each other's spaces again, that there is always the ancestral calling to think, act, and live in relation. Last year, when my life was confined to this city, I used Kahiki to rethink my activism and to move beyond the piece of earth I called home, even while I lived thousands of miles from it, to reconsider how my actions could be and needed to be for the larger region. I had to reconsider, in other words, how deeply planting myself and my fight in place could allow me to engage more meaningfully with, the pla with places across the sea, including home. Shortly after the cancellation of last year's conference, my life became absorbed by RIMPAC, the rim of the Pacific Maritime War Games held in Hawaii every other year for the last five decades. Though many of us had hoped that a global pandemic would be reason enough to cancel the highly destructive exercises, we quickly learned that not even the threat of infection and mass death could stop the, be could stop the beast that is militarism or the ongoing attempt to justify violence in the maintenance of colonial power, power that is sustained at the expense of those of us whose lives, lands, and waters have already been deemed expendable or able to be sacrificed for empire. Though opposition to RIMPAC has been strong since it began in 1971, our efforts in 2020 brought new awareness to the perverted logics that enable it. The disease of militarism, in other words, was essentially made more visible because of another disease, the coronavirus. While the reasons for opposing RIMPAC are many, and while they span environmental, social, political, ideological, cultural, and spiritual realms, COVID-19 provided us the chance to plead to people at home in Hawaii and internationally who are all con concerned about health and safety, each of them and each of us, wherever we were, facing the same virus. Our activism then sought to humanize those of us most often so effectively dehumanized that military war games are believed to be justifiable for the benefit of some, even as they put others and they put us at risk. While living here in Aotearoa, I could not go home to participate in actions against RIMPAC. At the same time, the members of the Cancel RIMPAC Coalition in Hawaii, members who I've learned from and have been incredibly motivated and inspired by, had to maintain physical distance even while they tried to maintain intimate proximity to the lands, waters, and peoples they were trying to protect. Being grounded here, though, made me think about how to navigate having to be in place while also yearning to be at home. It made me think about how my activism had to shift to turn back to the lands I stood on and to seek connection through Eve, through roots. For many here in Aotearoa, RIMPAC was a Hawaii issue. It is a Hawaii issue, something that occurred over there, far away, overseas, with little connection or impact on lives, bodies, and environments here. My opposition to it therefore had to be expanded. It could no longer be about my land and my people alone or the fierce love that I extend overseas to my piece of earth, but had to be about all of us and about exposing the structures that enable and sustain oppression, destruction, and erasure across the region, suffocating roots, denying us connection and growth. When I truly thought about RIMPAC, I realized the ways my own activism had been stifled by the myth of our separateness the myth that confines certain issues to certain places and certain peoples. 
tapping into the wisdom that is kahiki and the knowing of our interconnectedness, I then reapproached the issue. Reframed, I realized that to fight against RIMPAC was to call for demilitarization, not just at home, but across Oceania. It was to call for abolishing police systems that are increasingly militarized. It was to call for freedom and justice. It was to call for the protection of all lands, all waters, and all of our more than human relatives who we depend on across the region. And it was to call for better futures, not just there, not just here, but everywhere. When reconsidered, I realized that I could not only oppose RIMPAC to protect my home, but had to also do so to protect the lands, grounds, and waters I now live on and in. When considered in relation to what Ponamu Jade Eichmann wrote about the Americanization of New Zealand's police forces last year, I saw RIMPAC as connected to the militarization or the so-called justified use of violence that targets Maori and Pacific bodies and leads to them being more likely to be stopped, more likely to be tasered, more likely to appear in court, more likely to be incarcerated, and more likely to suffer here in Aotearoa. In this context, ending RIMPAC was also about calling attention to the international links between militaries that play in international waters, collaborate, and, this, and then sustain ongoing violence on the ground. When reconsidered, I realized that I could not only oppose RIMPAC to protect my future, but had to do so to protect the rights of so many others to dream and build futures for themselves. Though Indonesia was not part of RIMPAC 2020, they have been part of RIMPAC's war games in the past, training, learning, refining their skills and attacking, invading and inflicting violence. When considered in relation to the ongoing genocide of West Papuans, I saw the war games as supporting the torture, rape and murder of Pacific peoples the displacements of their families, the destruction of their lands, the complete disregard of their humanity and their black skins. In this context, ending RIMPAC was also about calling attention to the ongoing gross human rights abuses and the need to consider how our activism on the ground can, plan, can plant roots that run far, finding kin in dark and tight spaces to give them breath. When we considered, I realized that I could not only oppose RIMPAC to fight for our right to be indigenous in our home and our right to safety and true security, but had to fight against the dehumanization of people of color everywhere. When considered in relation to Andrea Smith's overview of the logics of white supremacy and how the assumption of white superiority provides material privileges that are enacted, experienced and embodied in a world that favors white skin, I saw RIMPAC as made possible by the rendering of some lives as less than, as inferior, as sacrificable. Smith's logics clarify that white supremacy marks black lives as enslavable, indigenous lives as exterminable, and other peoples of color as so effectively othered that they always appear as threat, as enemy, or as constant opposition and agitator. Through these logics, militarism is exposed as the mechanism through which violence is legitimated and only made legitimate because the targets of such violence have already been branded as either able to be enslaved, able to be exterminated, or able to be marked as enemy. In this context, ending RIMPAC was also about calling attention to the logics of white supremacy, recognizing that we do no good by trying to call, crawl out from the oppression of one logic while maintaining the others. White supremacy as a structure, in other words, can only be destroyed when we address all three, working in solidarity, recognizing that a world where Black Lives Matter is a world that is bettered for all of us. Last year's actions to end RIMPAC made me tap into the ancestral memory of our connection. Kahiki gave me the conceptual and spiritual permission to plant my Eve deeply where I was and where I still am. It gave me the ability to think about how activism in place can be for all places when we recognize connections, when we remember that our region will not be free and our lives will not be liberated and our environments will not be healthy until we are all free, until we are all liberated, until all and until all of our environments are healthy, thriving, and able to nourish underground. Ekoloana no kieve, ikieve. When I moved back to Aotearoa and recognized my love growing for a place I was not born in, a place I had no claim to. I found the most profound lesson of my prior explorations of kahiki and oceanic connectedness to be the mobility of aloha aina. 
or that fierce love of place that we all have the ability to cultivate, no matter what it's called or how it is expressed by our peoples. When I moved back to Aotearoa, I finally understood what motivated my ancestors to compose chants, songs, stories, and proverbs to remember Kahiki, their ancestral homeland. I finally understood what propelled them to honor it, even after generations of living and growing in Hawaii. It was aloha. It was an acknowledgement of the way places feed, sustain, and nourish us from the ground, even when we are no longer standing on that ground. It was a deep love and respect for the exchange of energy and nutrients that keep us alive generations forward and generations back. Whenever I feel my heart ache for home, for the protection of my mountain, Mauna Kea, for the sound of my river, Waikoloa, for the smell of my rains, the kipu'upu'u as they hit red dirt roads, and for the feeling I get in my toes when I am standing in Waimea, my piece of earth. I think of my kupuna, of my ancestors, and I know that they had carried their love of place, their love of kahiki to their new homes, and that I had and continue to have the responsibility to do the same. So I grow my love every day for a new place, for Aotearoa and for the head of Maui's fish by putting roots into the earth, not to claim space, belonging or story, but to find the tree stumps that need nourishment, that need me to find light and sustenance in the sun and nutrients in the rain. I put roots into earth by asking how I can be of service to those already planted and deeply rooted here, how I can stand for their sovereignty and self-determination, trying to never be like the trees that crowd others or deplete others, but like those of kin that find kin underground. I now believe that if I can grow my own aloha for a place I had no previous connection to, even while that place lays far beneath the concrete footpaths of the busy capital and colonial city I live in, then I know my students can do the same, even if they are not practiced or experienced in it. I now live and teach with the conviction that before I can encourage my students to be warriors for the region, as I always hope they will be in their own ways, that I have to champion being better human beings where we are. I now live and teach with the conviction that we will be better for the region as a whole when we know how to look down, to acknowledge place, to practice that fierce love, even if it means first learning the stories in the ground so that we can be more conscious of our Pacific places, even those that are not our own or especially those that are not our own. I now live and teach with the conviction that our actions on the ground will find their way to the ocean that connects us and that those actions can feed the rest of the region. I now know that I do not have to cross the ocean and go to West Papua, in other words, to fight against genocide, but must do the work on the ground where I am, exposing New Zealand's relationships with Indonesia, the country keeping West Papua under military occupation. I know that I do not need to, go, to cross the ocean and go to Guahan, in other words, to fight for demilitarization, but have to do the work where I am, fighting for demilitarization everywhere by exposing its destructive truths and perverted logics and teaching a new generation of learners who will know of its atrocities. I know that I do not need to cross the ocean and go to Tuvalu, Kiribati, or the Marshall Islands or any of the other places most vulnerable to rising sea levels to help them, in other words but need to be better and do better where I live, advocating for climate justice, pushing the government to reduce carbon emissions and just being more aware about what I put into the earth and ocean with the choices I make about how to live my life. I now live and teach with the conviction that it is my responsibility to attempt to navigate the uncertainties, the unfamiliar, the messiness, the groundedness, the stickiness, the tense mo moments of disconnection, the times where we find ourselves both on land and in water at the same time, being honest about the ruptures so that we can meet together again in ways that feed, in ways that nourish, in ways that are sustaining for all of us, even if and when we do not all want to be found underground. I now live and teach with the conviction that although I was not hired by a university to raise an oceanic consciousness that is rooted and based in place, that it is my responsibility to do so. I do so because Pacific studies is not what I teach, but what I do, and that there is far too much work in the region 
to form too much work to be done in the region that I cannot waste time tiptoeing around the problems we face pretending objectivity and distance. I have to take my students to the ground, giving them the chance to grow roots so that they can feel and love the region with me. This is the time we're ready. Our students are ready. It is in the uncertain, in the unfamiliar, and in a swampy mixture of land and water that we can plant our ebe and grow. Ekolowana no kieve, ikieve. Mahalo. Mahalo, Dr. Case. Oh my goodness, I am inspired. Um, thank you for your beautiful insights, your prose, your, um, I think what hit me most was your vulnerability and your reflexivity, which is, you know, a hallmark of Pacific studies. Um, so we're going to go into our Q&A. Oh, before I was supposed to mention your amazing book. So your book just came out. Um, it's called Everything Ancient Was Once New, Indigenous Persistence from Hawaii to Kahiki. And it was published by UH Press um, last month, February 2021. So congratulations on that. And we wanted to mention it um, before Q&A, just in case there might have been questions on that. So now we're going to go into the Q&A. We have a few questions already. Um, from Helena Kapuni Reynolds. He says, Aloha Emalani, mahalo for this beautiful talk. I'm quite interested in your journey and shifting thoughts regarding the identity of settler in relation to Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this tension has to do with the broader circulation of settler colonial studies within the Pacific and beyond? I wonder how studies of settler colonialism, albeit important, can also hinder our ability to connect and relate to one another. I was hoping you could share more about your thoughts on how you navigate these fields. Yeah, I am um, actually something I talk about in the book. Um, in one of the chapters, I talk specifically about being an indigenous person, indigenous to Hawaii, now living on land. I'm not indigenous too. And I, I write about kind of the journey to navigate that positionality and how I went from calling myself a settler, which actually made both Pacific people and Maori people kind of uncomfortable. Um, so I went from that to then looking at um, uh, what some scholars have called kind of like a more triangular framework, how you have settlers, indigenous, and, and then arrivants. Um, and arrivants you know, whether we find a better word for that or not, arrivants are sort of a category of people who are unlike the settlers who came over with the distinct goal of settling a place and displacing indigenous peoples. These are other peoples who have arrived for other reasons and who often also suffer um, certain oppressions under the settler colonial government. Um, so I started to kind of think of myself as being in that category um, rather than, than settler. Um, and I do think that that's where Pacific peoples, particularly in the context of Aotearoa or other Pacific non-Hawaiian peoples in the context of Hawaii kind of fit. Um, and the reason why, even though it sounds so Western to kind of have this triangular framework, but the reason why I find it kind of helpful is because I have heard kind of, it can be kind of a damaging narrative when it, it, here in the context of New Zealand, I have heard people say, well, I'm indigenous to the region. So I have a right to Aotearoa, I'm indigenous to Oceania. And while yes, we may, may all be indigenous to Oceania, we have to remember that indigeneity functions in particular ways for particular reasons in specific places. Here in a settler colonial society, indigeneity matters and it has to matter. And I actually think that it is my genealogical responsibility to acknowledge that and to therefore not get in the way of efforts for tino rangatiratanga or sovereignty of tangata whenua here in Aotearoa. Um, so I've kind of, you know, right now that kind of triangular framework of, of settler, indigenous and arrivant, I find helpful because it does account for different experiences that are not indigenous and that are not, you know, colonial in the same way as, as when we look at settlers. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that there's in, an incredible amount of diversity in that category of arrivant that's not a homogenous group either. Um, but that's sort of how I've tried to navigate um, my own positionality here in Aotearoa. And, and something that I actually talk about a lot is that it wasn't until I moved here that I had to even ask those kinds of questions. In Hawaii, I am the indigenous person. Um, so you don't really have to think about what it might mean to be indigenous outside of your own place. 
Um, I do think that to kind of wrap back to some parts of um, Helena's question, if I remember it correctly, I do think that studies of settler colonialism have influenced the ways that we see ourselves, that we see each other, particularly when we are in each other's spaces. And I do think that that discourse is useful. Um, that's the reason I use it. But I also do think that it doesn't account for certain specific or specificities that we find in the Pacific, like the fact that we are linked by genealogy. Um, so that genealogical link and that shared fuckapapa has to be accounted for. And that's something that I, I continually try to unpack in my own work. I don't have it all figured out, but it's definitely something that continues to intrigue me. Where I am right now though, is I do firmly believe that we can't lean upon our genealogical connections to then justify our position in place if that doesn't also come with um, accountability to the first people of that place. Um, so I acknowledge shared fuck up, 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 but rather than saying, well, that's my that's my way of feeling comfortable here and feeling comfortable comfortable about positionality, I say instead, I am connected by fuck up, up, up what am I going to do about it? It has to lead to action, particularly in the in these settler colonial contexts. I hope that answered his, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> I think it might have. Um, so we have another question, mahalo for that. We have another question in the same vein, but um, with more specific um, advice. So Heather asks, what advice would you give to those who aren't local to the land they inhabit, but would like to plant their roots appropriately? Yeah, I, I, you know, I actually get this question a lot. I gave a keynote last year for a geography conference um, and I was talking about, um, the, the main theme of the con conference was, well, the, the main theme of my keynote was about the concept of sacredness and talking about land as being sacred. Um, and anyway, this, this woman came up, to ap came up to me afterwards. She's um, Pākeha, Pālangi, not, you know, non-Pacific, non-Māori, um, uh, white. And she said, you know, I, I love this place. I love this country and I'm struggling to love it and feel rooted here. Um, because of what you said about indigeneity and, and honoring indigenous connections um, and rights to place. And I, I basically said, you know, there, there's nothing saying that you can't love a place. There's nothing saying that you can't plant roots. Um, I think though, what we have to be careful of is in the way that we articulate our belonging. Oftentimes here in Aotearoa, I might hear um, non-Maori, for instance, introduce themselves using a very Maori structure by saying, this is my mountain, this is my river, this is my land, you know, and, and I'm not Maori, so I can't say whether that is right or wrong, but there is a part of me that says in that act of claiming those places, you are simultaneously displacing the people who actually do belong to those places. Like when I say Mauna Kea is my mountain, it is because it is, it is my mountain, but I would never come here and find another mountain as much as I might love it and say the same thing. So I, to get back to the question, I do believe that we can extend roots, but those roots that we extend have to always be mindful of the people who are already here. And I think we have to extend roots to help and nourish. So always think about, okay, why am I feeling so drawn to this place and how can I use that feeling of connectedness to then advocate for the Fenua itself, for the land itself, and also for the people who are most intimately connected to it. I actually do believe that it is through having that kind of intimacy with place that we will be better for it, but it can never be in the way that we try to then stake a claim where there are indigenous people who already belong to that place. I hope that that answered the question. Um, so we also have a question. Um, okay, here we go. Different brands of Pacific studies have emerged in the continental US, Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, even Europe and Asia. How do we as Pacific studies communities build these important and differing approaches or philosophies while better linking with each other in productive ways? Where is Pacific studies in the 21st century and where are we going? Mm. 
Ooh, excellent question. Excellent question. Whoever asked that, I'd love to link up with you because I think we need to create, I think we need to strengthen our networks. Um, I think we are such an exciting field, an exciting area of study. I think there's so much that we can do. Something I will say about the specific programs in different places is that Pacific Studies needs to, and, and often does in our, in our different programs, account for place. I mean, when I mo first moved here to be a PhD student from Hawaii, I realized how different the Pacific looks based on where you're in it, where, based on where you are in it. And I know that sounds quite common sense, but my view of the Pacific was so different in Hawaii. And then I moved here um, and due to you know mass uh, or migrations of Pacific peoples coming over in the 50s and 60s for work and employment, there are certain dominant populations of Pacific peoples here and I'm not one of them. So when I first came over, people knew I was from Hawaii, but some of them didn't even see me as being a Pacific Islander. Um, and so just that's, again, to reinforce the point that what the Pacific looks like and who Pacific is, is gonna look different depending on where you are in the Pacific. And I think that our Pacific Studies programs do a good job, or the ones that I know about, do a really good job of acknowledging that, of talking about the whole region, but acknowledging how that region functions and is articulated in place. With that said, I do think that there's so much more that we can do to connect, um, to talk to each other, to communicate with each other, to let our students learn from each other. And that's why conferences like this are so amazing. Um, because again, like my students here in Aotearoa are gonna learn something completely new when students from Hawaii or students from other parts of the world are speaking about the same region, but in very different ways. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that we need to be networking a lot more in terms of the question of where Pacific Studies is going. Something, I mean, I loved so much about Teresia, um, but one thing I really loved about her own approach to Pacific Studies is that she saw it as constantly evolving. She was always tweaking her courses. She was always thinking about where Pacific Studies needs to go. Of course, she had certain prescriptions, suggested prescriptions for Pacific Studies, but she knew we needed to push back at those as well. Um, something that I've personally tried to articulate into a Pacific Studies pedagogy in my own work is a more conscious um, acknowledgement of our environments. Because um, I saw that that perhaps wasn't a, a primary focus in the program that I teach or teach into. And so I've made that a, a, you know, a, a focus and you can see that in my speech. And I do that because of course we all know our environments are in drastic decline and our students need to be at the forefront of helping us to protect it. Um, so I've tried to articulate on top of Teresia's three prescriptions, this need to acknowledge the environment, to, to actually acknowledge the places that we're in so that we can grow our protective actions from place outward. Um, so all of that is to say that Pacific Studies is not one thing. There's no one hard and fast definition, and that's the beauty of it. Um, Pacific Studies is as varied as the region is and is as shifting as our ocean is and needs to be. And so I challenge students and encourage students to constantly push back at it, to find, help us find the limitations and help us create it as well. The other thing about Pacific Studies is it's not just ours as teachers, it's ours as students and as a much larger community. Um, yeah, I feel like I've just ranted for a while about Pacific Studies, but yeah, it's such an exciting space to, to work in and create in. So yeah. You can rant as long as you want about Pacific Studies Dr. Case. Um, a question from Axel. He says, Aloha and Mahalo Nui, Dr. Case. I was hoping you could speak more on your new book and in relation to your vision for what might be the new normal um, and what it might look like for us in and outside of Oceania, especially for those of us far from home. Um, and just a reminder to all participants, feel free to post in the Q&A um, feature. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'm quite excited about, about the new book. Um, it's based on my PhD research, but as you heard in the keynote, um, in 2019, I revisited the PhD, the thesis, we call it a thesis here, dissertation. Um, you might be more familiar with that. I revisited it. I had already submitted it as a book manuscript and I looked at it in 2019 and I was like, man, I really just need to, I need to redo this. So I took it apart, uh, which perhaps wasn't, at the time it might not have seemed as the most intelligent choice, but I ripped it apart and basically wrote something new. So there are pieces from the PhD thesis, which focuses on kahiki, 
in the book. But what I tried to do in the book was, um, whereas in my thesis, I explored kahiki as a concept from the past and looked at how it functioned in different parts, different points in history in the past, I really wanted to bring kahiki into contemporary times. I wanted to really just talk about what it means to me, how it's been instrumental in my life, um, how it functions for me as a conceptual and spiritual space. Um, and right, at, right before I had started revising the book, I had been home um, on Mauna Kea and I was at the Pu'uhonua, Pu'uhonua or Pu'uhuluhulu at the sanctuary. Um, and I came back and I was like, that's kahiki. Kahiki is a sanctuary. It is a place that we can visit in our dreams, in our, in our thoughts, in our ambitions. Um, it's a place we can visit when we need healing um, when we may have done something wrong and we need to reflect. So it's a place for growing, it's a place for safety. Um, and I brought Kahiki into contemporary times. And so in every chapter of the book, I look at it as a sanctuary and how it's functioning, functioning in different contexts. Everything from protective actions for the environment, to looking at, at issues like Mauna Kea, um, issues like Ihumatao here in Aotearoa, um, and then all the way to how it functions in helping me to understand my own positionality as an indigenous person living in a place I'm not indigenous to. Um, so that's a little bit more about the book. And actually the title of the book, people often, I've gotten such beautiful comments about the title, Everything Ancient Ones Once Knew, comes from a poem that I had written about the destruction of Tu'ahu and the Hale on Mauna Kea in 2019. Um, and when those things were, were destroyed by the state, the justification for destroying them and dismantling was that dismantling them was that they weren't traditional or customary because they weren't old. They were built by contemporary Kia'i. Um, and so I remember just hearing that story thinking, Kanaka are never allowed to age. We are caught in this state of perpetual infancy and we're not allowed to grow. We're not allowed to evolve. Um, and so I wrote a poem by that name and the book took that name as well, because what I try to do in the, um, in the book as a whole is take old concepts and constantly make them new so that they can also be ancient, you know, so that they can also be renewed and constantly worked with and grappled with far into the future. And I try to argue that everything that we are doing today, even if it, even if it is brand new, has the potential and should have the right to become ancient if it is for the betterment of our people. So in the book is, yes, this exploration of all these past things and current events, but also this deep desire to build and dream better futures. Um, I can't remember what the rest of the question was and if I've answered it all, but but yeah, that's, that's, that's a little bit about the book. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um... Okay, we have one last question. Um, can you share any updates about the program at Vic and some of the new or exciting things to look forward to? It's always been a leader um, and the work that you, Teresia, April Henderson and others have done and continue to do sets a high standard in the field. What is on the horizon and how can other Pacific communities support that? Oh, mahalo nui for that. You know, I, I give full credit to the women who started this program and led it for years, um, Teresia, and of course, my lovely colleague, Dr. April Henderson. Um, I came to this program because of the, before those same reasons, I wanted to work with Teresia and I chose it and came here and, and then just fell in love with the work that, that they um, were doing. Um, I think what's on the horizon for us, we're, we're actually super excited about our students, um, our postgrads, the, the work that they're doing. Uh, honestly, as a teacher, I am most, um, I just honestly feel quite privileged every day that we get to open up these spaces for students to explore themselves, explore the region, um, and then contribute to it. So on, on one thing that I'm really looking forward to, one of our um, PhD students just recently submitted her thesis, um, Emma Powell. Um, all about Akapapa Anga or genealogical practices in the Cook Islands. Honestly, I can't wait for people to read it um, and, and really engage with that work. Um, but we have PhD students looking at a range of things. But in terms of our own program, I think something that at least I've been quite um, intentional about in the last couple of years is kind of really looking at PASI 101, which is an introduction to Pacific studies course. 
and how, um, like I said in the keynote, how we can make sure that while it, is, while it is introducing students to the region, it is also helping them to navigate how to be better people in the region. Um, on the first day of class, my students think I'm crazy, but I always say, like, I'm here to radicalize you. I'm here to make you be more conscious. You might not want to be radicalized. You might be the student who's coming in and just wants to learn information to then get regurgitated on a test, but that's not the way I teach. So you have a choice to engage or to disengage, that's on you. But my goal as a teacher is not just to teach you content, it is to make you love the Pacific. And that love, as cheesy as it might sound, it is what pushes everything that I teach. Um, another course that I teach that, it, that Teresia developed and that April taught for years is about, it's called Framing the Pacific, but it is about looking at the work of Pacific and Maori artists and activists in the region. And I absolutely love that course because it allows students to think of themselves as evolving and emerging activists. And I don't just mean as people who will go out and stand on the front lines, but the people who will be engaged in some way, even if it is not on social media, um, and not you know, receiving thousands of likes, but will be engaged in the Pacific. And so I think something really unique that, that I see in our own program here in VIC is this push to get students to be engaged as active members of the Pacific, active in, in protecting it, active in engaging with it, and active in helping us to dream better futures for, the, for, for our peoples and for our region. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Dr. Case, um, for providing a, a vision, you know, the visions that sustain us um, for Pacific studies and for the Pacific as a whole. We, we really appreciate that. Um, I want to read off the last comments from Q&A we have from Nalani Wilson Hoku Flitu. Mahalo oh, 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 and Melani. And we also have from Deon Perez. Mahalo Ike Kumu. Not much of a question, but just sending aloha as a Honoka'a girl missing home. Mahalo Nui. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that brings us to the end of our keynote session. Thank you to, again to Dr. Case um, for gracing us with your, your knowledge. Um, as a reminder, we do have, um, we are switching links. So uh, this is a webinar session. We're going to go to our, our general conference meeting. So we're going to type that in the chat, um, but that, that's our next um, stop for, for the conference. And we will meet back here at 1035. So thank you again for for your knowledge, Dr. Case. Um, and mahalo. Ahui ho kako, mahalo. <laughs>